Ramadan online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. East London Mosque in London Muslim Centre would love to say thank you to the following businesses and charities for sponsoring our Ramadan Online 2021 program. Islamic Relief, Muntad Aid, Global Relief Trust, Penny Appeal, Muslim Aid, Human Relief Foundation, Muslim Burial Fund, Irani Taylor Solicitors, City Realtor, AWMA Architecture. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan Mubarak. Another day in the life of the Muslims, wherever you are, on behalf of the East London Mosque, we bring you Ramadan online. Everything for the family to take the best of Ramadan. There's something for everyone, inshallah. So don't forget to make sure you join. Uh, this session is about diabetes. And we had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali in one of our other sessions. And today we have the honor and uh, opportunity again to speak to Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali. Once again, welcome to the Community Hour uh, with the Eastern Mosque. It's about, being stay, it's about staying connected and it's bringing the masjid to your house. So inshallah, wherever you are, uh, welcome once again. Dr. Abdul Wadud, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me again. And thank you to the Eastern Mosque for giving me the opportunity. Now, doctor, as a GP, uh, diabetes is a major, major issue globally and, of course, here in England. Uh, are you known to be very sweet with your diabetic patients? With my diabetic patients? Um, as in, are you ruthless with them or see, you're very kind? Uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, I'm both sweet and sour. Oh, really? So, um, when it comes to advice and following advice, uh, purely because go following good advice will mean that they will do better for their own health. I am fairly strict and strong, but in a nice way, firm, but you know, fair. So I do f give them advice. I'm quite strong about that and do expect and hope that they do follow the advice because ultimately it helps them. So I, I, I would say firm but fair. Firm but fair. Well... Maybe, maybe we might read comments uh, later on and find out how, how true that is. If, if there's any patients who are watching, uh, you can probably send some comments in and uh, maybe we'd, we'd be able to share those with Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali uh, at some point, inshallah. Now, in regards to diabetes, uh, is there an age factor in there? Is there a gender factor in there? Or... You know, you could be of any age and you could have diabetes. Uh, you, could be a ma uh, you could be male or female and have diabetes. Are there any, 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 anything specific when it comes to age or gender? Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to age and gender, it depends on the type of diabetes. So there's two uh, types of di uh, diabetes, uh, d uh, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 uh, generally starts in very young people. So we commonly see young children who develop symptoms of diabetes and that's type 1. Um, and, uh, ty uh, and that's mainly because your pancreas, uh, which produced the insulin, doesn't work very well from the beginning. So the symptoms are picked up early. Um, and t generally they tend to need insulin from, the very, uh, from a very early age. Um, type 2 generally develops in the adult population and uh, there's lots of factors with type 2 uh, diabetes. Um, so um, genetics plays a part, so your ethnicity, uh, but more importantly, uh, environment plays a part. Uh, weight is very important, so overweight, more, more, pro more um, prevalent in overweight people. Um, uh, diet is very important uh, and uh, uh, lack of exercise. So these things do contribute. Um, and uh, certainly from an uh, Asian um, perspective, diet is important because we have a very high intake of carbohydrates, especially in the Bengali Pakistani community, Indian as well, where we have rice or chapati. And that does contribute a lot. So um, from a male and from a male and female point of view, maybe a bit more in male uh, Asian population than uh, the female Asians, but uh, it's no, it, there's not a huge difference. So type two diabetes is probably a big concern with your patients. I'm assuming. Mm. What 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 are the indicators of type two, and uh, you know how how quickly can that be uh, can that be caught if you like, uh, you know, if my dad has it, you know, how long before I get it? 
So obviously, um, a strong family history is a strong indicator of you might get diabetes. So if your mom and dad and brother have it, then th th that is something to think about. Um, so you need to act more uh, fo in a focused manner, uh, act strongly to prevent diabetes or delay diabetes by uh, focusing on the other things like uh, keep your weight down. So uh, obese patients tend to have diabetes, um, what we call the pear-shaped uh, body. Uh, there's a link between that. So obesity around the stomach um, is a strong indicator. Um, keep your weight down. That's very important. Um, exercise, um, uh, he eating healthy, eating low-carbohydrate diets. So these are the things you can do, but one of the key things to focus on is if you see that there's a high risk you might get diabetes, is to keep the weight down. So some of the community who's watching uh, this particular program uh, often are having uh, their staple diet being very starchy so rice is very starchy uh, probably uh, roti is probably very starchy and often the, the these foods originate from parts of the world where the weather and and climate is is very good for those food whereas you know we so for example my father who's used to eating rice like many of our audience who are watching this uh, originates from a place where rice was eaten as a staple uh, food. But if, uh, you know, it seems like often we continue the same pattern and the same level of rice consumption. But the weather that we, uh, we're surrounded by doesn't necessarily help the cause. Uh, the, the, the sugar within rice, is that more dangerous than the sugar in my fairy cake? Well, um in a way, yes, because when we have a plate of rice, the amount of sugar which comes from the rice is a huge amount. Uh, so we, a lot of people say, oh, doctor, shall I cut down the amount of uh, sugar I have in my tea from two spoons to one spoon or one spoon to half a spoon? How many cups of tea would they have in a day? Two or three cups? So mm. you save one or two spoons. Whereas if they have a plate of rice, that's a good 20, 25 spoons, if not more. I, I, I have to raise my hands and say, I'm, I'm sure I have more than one plate, doctor. <laughs> so uh, as you can see, the impact, I mean, you're not, the, you're not alone. I mean, I myself do have rice sometimes as well. Um, and it's been in our family in a generation. So uh, especially the elderly population, they find it very difficult to move away from that. So going back to this, so there's high sugar content. Once you eat the rice, it breaks down and stores in your body, in your liver, muscle. Uh, so th this is what, and fat as well. So, th so there's a bigger impact and probably more dangerous in that respect to have rice than have uh, your sugar um, drink. Of course, there's a bit of sugar there um, or your teaspoon of uh, sugar in your tea. So we have to look at wh what has the highest content of sugar and try to avoid those. Mm. So does the body break down sugar from rice more easily or sugar from a cake or a drink? You know, which one is more easier to, uh, for the body to deal with? So to deal with, uh, so uh, sugars are stored in different places. Um, sugars, wherever they come, they do get stored, they're broken down. Um, I think uh, ultimately if we're looking at diabetes, we need to look at, as I said, the, the, the food which has the least sugar content because it will be broken down, stored in our body. If we're eating lots of rice uh, continuously two or three times a day, every day, then obviously, uh, and without a lack of exercise to burn uh, that off, uh, then you're accumulating the sugar. So. Um, in terms of uh, you know sugary foods or rice, I think it's about which one has more sugar. Now, obviously, what we also recommend is looking at um, the uh, the health content, the kind of content of a product when you buy them, and see which one has a high calorie level, high sugar level. So this is quite important as well. Kind of um, your cal what we call calorie counting, but mm. more for health rather than to lose weight. So th that helps. So it's not necessarily as as I said which one breaks down easily, it's more, which one has a more sugar content. So if we uh, needed to change our diet uh, from, you know, for example, let's say the average rice eating family, uh, probably maybe eating rice twice a day. Mm -hmm. Now, how, you know, how can they perhaps, would you recommend that to be slightly changed, uh, particularly with families that have diabetes already within, mm -hmm. within the family, so the parents have it, so you know, there's a good chance that you'll be uh, inherited uh, by mm -hmm. the siblings, you know, the, by, the, by the kids. So if, if we were to alter the diet, does, would that have a positive impact? 
Absolutely. And I think it's been having a positive impact over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we're fortunate. We live in a first world country. We have a very strong primary health care system, secondary care as well, and a, a lot of education and a lot of focus on teaching people, uh, developing the diet, improving the diet. So uh, the older generation who have been eating rice and chapati and roti for a long time and who have diabetes, there's a lot of focus from primary care certainly the dietitians and the diabetic consultants to try and improve the diet and there's a lot of um, focus and energy put into that and I have seen um, our elderly patients slowly cutting out rice you know from three times a day to twice a day from two plates to one plate so it, it depends on the education and their kind of uh, intensity of uh, engaging with them so that's certainly improving um, but probably needs to improve more uh, secondly, with regards to the younger generation, the second generation, um, working outside, working in offices and outside and doing other things, we don't necessarily have to have rice and we have access to other foods. Um, having uh, excess money to go out and eat out, there's lots of different foods, uh, food products out there. So, you know, grilled food, um, European food, um, Asian food, uh, which isn't necessarily rice. So this is changing. Our eating habit is changing. With the pandemic, people are getting more takeaways now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we're staying at home. And um, even uh, myself, you know, I, I do have that sometimes the family does. So I can see the shift in the second generation from going from our first generation having th rice twice a day or three times a day to having rice probably once a day or probably less than that. Um, I think when it comes to our children, um, it may be even less. But the key thing is having a good balance. It's not coming away from rice, it's having a good balance, having the right portions, but mixing it with uh, meat, um, fruits, vegetables, very important, having less oil, less fat, things like that. Uh, speaking of less oil and less fat, Ramadan is a major time where a lot of fat and a lot of oil is consumed. And I think it's an opportunity for all of our viewers uh, to actually plan their Ramadan diet right now, uh, you know, and, and really make the, make, make, uh, you know, the diet of Ramadan really work for them. And I think, I think, I think we all can do better in, in improving when it comes to uh, fatty food, greasy food. And Ramadan's a wonderful time. For those who've just joined us, you're watching the Community Hour uh, with the Eastern Mosque Ramadan online. Uh, it's about being, uh, you know, staying connected, bringing the message to your houses. We are speaking to Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali, who's a GP uh, in London, um, and the discussions around diabetes, uh, people who are watching. Uh, you may suffer from diabetes, uh, um, family members, parents uh, may have it, you may not have it as of yet. What can you uh, do to ensure that you, know, you, you kind of slow down the onset uh, by a better diet, by better exercise, and so on and so forth. Now, diabetes and Ramadan. It's, uh, it's that's major kind of dynamics, lots of uh, lots of issues uh, for those who, who have diabetes, particularly, I'm sure, when you are managing your patients. What, what are the issues that come about when it comes to diabetes? And we will come to the vaccination. I know it's because of the pandemic vaccination is a major factor. But generally, what, what issues are you having to deal with with your patients when it comes to Ramadan and diabetes? So, um Fasting is one of the five, uh, one of the five we have to do, and it's very um, open, uh, and people can see it. So we find that in our in our patients, in our cultures and societies, people are more, much more uh, fixed on uh, fasting. Uh, for some reason then say praying uh, and they're very adamant they want to fast even if they have chronic health conditions or acute health conditions. So what we find is that in an elderly population who have things like diabetes, uh, kidney disease and other things, um, cardiovascular heart disease, that they, they want to fast. Going back to diabetes, um, this has major implications uh, and uh, especially patients who are on insulin, um, they, uh, they need to try not fast because the, or they're by, by definition high risk, uh, very unwell and with insulin it's difficult to maintain um, a good uh, sugar level with poor control. Uh, and uh, if, you've, if your diabetes is so advanced then you're likely to have heart disease. Uh, you like to have kidney disease, um, so these things. So um, this is one of the issues we're having, where patients want to fast. But my message to patients is that if you want to fast, 
um, speak to your GP straight away, um, uh, so discuss with him how you can do it safely, uh, and there are ways to kind of work around that, um, whether you're diet control diabetic or controlled through tablets, oral medication, or insulin. But generally, we find patients on insulin, they want to fast, and this is something we need to try and explain to them that it's not far than you to fast because you're so unwell. Mm. So this is one of the challenges we have. Uh, so basically, you, you're talking about how life is more important than necessarily fasting literally because someone's, uh, someone's got a health condition that will impact you know, the, on, on their life mm. and therefore the opportunity is provided by Islam to, to, to not do that, to maybe make up for it, to, to do kafara because they, they, they couldn't fast. So that, that space and that opportunity is there. I know some of our parents and elders, they're very, very adamant uh, in, in wanting to do both. You know, they, want to, they want to fast and they also want to manage manage their diabetes, uh, which is, I, I, I would say, for our audience who are watching, you know, if sometimes your parents are being very adamant that they want to fast, and of course, uh, you need to consult your doctor, uh, even if your local imam is uh, available and accessible, maybe call the imam and uh, get the imam to speak directly to your, to your parent, to your father or mother, and explain to them, you know, whether they have to fast or not in the, in the given circumstance. And of course, uh, you know, d we need to be able to take the right medical ad advice. Islam is always giving precedence to the preservation of life. That is an utmost uh, teaching uh, from Islam. Now, COVID-19 uh, has also impacted on uh, people's Ramadan. You know, uh, especially since the vaccine has come out. We know last Ramadan the vaccine wasn't available. Vaccine is now available. You know, apart from a lot of uh, rumors and, you know, lots of <coughs> facts and non, you know, fiction, if you like, uh, conspiracy and things like that, a lot more people are actually taking the vaccine, which is very important. Now, you know, should Muslims be taking the vaccine? Uh, you know, you're in Ramadan. And you want to fast, but you also need to take the vaccine. Should we be taking the vaccine? Sure. So, alhamdulillah, uh, when we started the vaccine, the uptake rate in the Asian Bengali community was very low. There's been a big drive, um, personally being involved in this drive to uh, increase the uptake. Uh, and alhamdulillah, an Opsimori poll which has come out in the last couple of days shows that uh, our uptake rate in the Asian community has actually dramatically increased from about 72% um, at the beginning of the vaccination rate to about 90%, which is catching up with the Caucasian population. So th that's very, very encouraging. Um, so, and keep up the good work. With regards to Ramadan, um, having the vaccination does not invalidate your fast. That's very important to know. Or the British um, Muslim Islamic Association, mm. um, which has uh, spoken to a lot of ulama and uh, sheikhs across the UK, uh, have found that nearly you everyone... You mean BIMA, British Islamic yeah, Medical British, Association? Yeah, BIMA, exactly. Mm -hmm. that they've spoken to ulama and they all can confirm that the vaccination doesn't invalidate your fast. So please, please, if you get the opportunity, take the vaccination, because not only are you going to protect yourself, you're going to protect others, but you're not going to break your fast. That's very important. So those who are taking the vaccine, that will, it will not invalidate your fast. So that's, that's something very important to remember. Uh, and ensure that if you get the opportunity to take the vaccine, you should take the vaccine. A lot of discussion when, around the vaccine, which one people to take, people should take. You know, there's different brands and different companies uh, that are pushing the vaccine to the community. Is there a particular vaccine that people should take rather than one that they shouldn't take? So like I myself, I have to say, I took sure. the Pfizer one. Yeah. I had my uh, second one recently. So, you know, I took the Pfizer one. It doesn't mean that I have to tell everyone that, oh, take the Pfizer one. Otherwise, every, you know, the others won't work. I'm assuming that's not the way vaccines work. Mm. So um, all the vaccinations which have been approved um, across the world, whether it's the UK, US, Europe, they're all safe. They've been assessed properly, they're all safe, uh, and they will all prevent death and disability and transmission across the world. Um, we are very fortunate in the UK that we've, um, the Oxford University um, uh, and AstraZeneca have developed uh, the vaccine which has become successful, and we've, at, we've had access to it. And, and because we've had access to it, the UK has managed to vaccinate over 50% of the adult population, um, and we can only compare to Europe and see where they are. Now, as a result, 
result of uh, these, this vaccination in the UK, we made a decision to have everyone taking the first dose and the second dose coming later. Because of this, we've managed to go up to 50% of the adult population. As a result of this, we've saved about 6,000 lives because we've taken that decision and we've got access to the uh, vaccine. And that one person out of the six could easily be your relative or your own parents. It's very important to know whilst 6,000 is a figure, when so you lose someone yourself, that one person is, is not a statistic. It's the important thing. And the vaccination has prevented 6,000 deaths minimum. Um, now, which vaccination? This is the Oxford vaccination. Um, there have been, obviously, um, announcements by the, um, the, HMR, the vaccination committee about uh, a very, very rare um, side effect um, of blood clots in the um, Oxford Ast AstraZeneca. Uh, if we look back, when Pfizer first came out, we started with Pfizer, there have been one or two incidents of blood clots. Um, with the Oxford AstraZeneca, uh, the evidence across Europe is, is firming up so there's anecdotal, you know, one or two here in the bait is firming up. Now, yes, it is a concern, but we have to put it in context. You're more likely to fall down the stairs and die than get a blood clot from the vaccine. You know, mm. you're, the risk of getting a blood clot from the vaccine is more or less the same as going to Bangladesh. Now, how many times do we hesitate going to Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or on a holiday with the family, with the kids? Not really, do we? Um, but the vaccination, the risk is, is similar or less. If you have, um, if you're a female person taking contraception, or you have a wife or anyone, the risk of a blood clot is much higher than a vaccination. So we have to put it in context. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a worry. We have to put it in context. So it, whatever comes along, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna or, or, or Oxford AstraZeneca, take whichever comes along. In the UK, we don't have a choice. Now, some people may say, OK, I think I'm not going to take the um, Pfizer. I'll take the, um, sorry, the Oxford AstraZeneca and take the Pfizer. You may not get the opportunity. By delaying it, you will still be prone to getting the um, virus. You may bring it into your house. You may fall unwell. And we know long COVID is more common in young people, young female people. And if you catch uh, coronavirus and you end up with long COVID, you can be very, very unwell for months and months and months, a year and a year and a half. I've got patients like that. So you have to look at the overall effect of getting the virus versus the risk of taking the vaccination. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, a lot of, you know, still a lot of people die even at this young age from the coronavirus, the long COVID situation. Um, and take the vaccination, the risks are extremely, extremely low. Yes, they're there, certainly with the Oxford AstraZeneca, but very, very low. And put it in context with flying, taking the pill, or just not doing anything, uh, walking around breathing the air has a risk of a blood clot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not that far off from the vaccination. So what about the situation if you know, you're someone who's taking insulin, as in injecting, and then at the same time, if you want to take a vaccine, then you also, there's another injection. Um, does, would, would that have any kind of uh, side effect or impact like that for, for a person who's having to use insulin and also have, mm -hmm. has gone for a vaccine? Um, absolutely not. So um, the advice is people who are diabetic, who are high risk, where the diabetes does affect your immune system, is to get the vaccination because you're more vulnerable to uh, becoming unwell from the coronavirus. Getting the injection, insulin, uh, alongside the actual vaccination, there's no connection, there's no correlation, there's no risks. So no, absolutely. Uh, there are very... Um, small number of contraindications, that means you shouldn't take the vaccine. A uh, couple of them is obviously a blood clot um, if you have a severe allergy to uh, things which make up the vaccination. So two, two or three things. If you're not sure, speak to your GP. But with the insulin injection, um, absolutely no, there's no problem taking the vaccine and the insulin injection. Great. For those who have just joined us, welcome to the Community Hour uh, with the Eastern Mosque Ramadan online. Uh, everything that you really want for Ramadan online is available with the Eastern Mosque. Stay connected, you know, connecting, uh, bringing the masjid to your house, uh, wherever you are. Uh, once again, Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan Mubarak. We are with uh, Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali, who is a GP uh, in the city of London. And we're talking about diabetes. We, we were just talking about uh, the vaccine and people who are also on insulin. Now, coming back to diabetes, um, when you are dealing with your patients, uh, often if you're dealing with, let's say, my mother or my father, uh, is there any advice that you're giving to the parents in regards to how they could help me 
as a sibling in the family because we know that it can be inherited. What kind of advice would you be given to uh, the parents? To the elder generation? Yeah, so if my dad's come to you uh, regarding diabetes, you already know as a doctor, there's a, mm. if, you know, if you have my family information, you already know that there's three uh, kids or four kids in the family and the father has it or the mother has it and there's a chance that it will be inherited. What can the parents be doing who are already diabet uh, diabetic uh, in trying to assist their own children, trying to kind of perhaps distance the onset before mm. you know, I actually get it or it starts? So uh, from that perspective, one thing they can do is they can follow their doctor's advice in cutting down on certain food products, living the lifestyle, exercise, weight loss. Uh, through them doing it, their children uh, will be encouraged uh, and they will realize the importance of doing this. Um, and by that, they can help the children delaying uh, the onset of diabetes or preventing it completely. Can it be prevented for, uh, you know, when it comes to because I've been told that, you know, if your mom and your dad has it, you're going to get it at some point in time. But has there been cases where it can actually yeah. be prevented? Absolutely. So um, lots of families where the parents have diabetes, the children don't get diabetes, uh, but obviously higher risk. Uh, what do they do? They follow the advice about keeping the weight down, a low BMI, weight versus height ratio, eating very healthily uh, and doing exercise. So absolutely. In fact, there's some evidence where if you do develop diabetes through very, very good uh, diet uh, and exercise and weight control, you can actually reverse diabetes. Reverse it? Reverse it. So there have been small studies so uh, again you need to look at bigger studies probably do more work but that there have been some uh, okay, you know uh, small groups now the month of Ramadan brings about all sorts of food sweets are a big thing within the Muslim community wherever you're watching from I'm sure you know if you're watching from India Pakistan Bangladesh sweet well, you know anywhere in the world whether in any part of the Muslim world Ramadan cannot be Ramadan without fried food, without sweets. You know, particularly from, you know, from my own family I could speak for. Fatty foods are going to be there. Sweets are going to be there. Is it a combination of both that does damage to someone who, who is diabetic? Or it's one. So is it, is, it, is it mainly about sweets and therefore... Or, you know, because you've mentioned that diet is a big factor. So if, 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 you, if we're talking about diet being a big factor, that means sweets are a part of that factor. Fried food is part of that factor. Maybe eating at the wrong time is... All, you know, I've, I, I know of uh, families where they're eating very late in the day. So really all that starch, if they're eating rice, is literally kind of storing up in the body and it's not getting, getting burnt. It, does that also add add value to people's chances uh, of, of diabetes? Because they're literally, the timing of their food consumption is actually very poor. So, you, you know, would you be expecting someone to be eating rice at 10 p.m. in the night, for example? So if, if we're thinking of diabetics who are in Ramadan... Um, Yes, uh, depending if you're insulin uh, dependent diabetic or um, oral, uh, oral agent dependent diabetic, um, the actual iftar, if we focus on iftar, so what you talked about is the sweets and uh, fried foods, it's usually an iftar. Um, so, sweets. Could be at suhoor. Could be as well. The mango. Um, so, yeah, um, so ab <laughs> absolutely, if you're very adventurous. Um, if you're looking at the sweet products, um, that increases your sugar level pretty quickly and that can cause a uh, problem if you're constantly eating sweet products your your sugar levels in your blood will be very high and difficult to control and that can cause lasting effects and it can cause if you if you eat enough it can cause a severe condition called diabetic ketoacidosis where you end up in hospital so that causes rapid rise of your sugar with regards to the fried foods obviously when we say fried foods we have a lot of oil um, in it, uh, uh, deep fry, and then we have a lot of carbohydrate as well. Um, so if it's the oil aspect, that will compound your other health conditions in relation to diabetes, like um, your art, you know, your cardiovascular disease is blocking your arteries, stroke again blocking off your arteries with a high cholesterol level. Um, eating a lot of carbohydrate again, um, that will slowly increase your um, sugar load in your body throughout the month.
So that will derange uh, your um, diabetic level, so to speak, uh, throughout the month. So they, they play uh, a part in different ways. So if you carry on eating a lot of carbohydrates, fatty food, yes, you're going to deteriorate, your diabetes is going to deteriorate um, uh, throughout the month gradually. And if you eat sweet foods, your sugars will go up quite quickly. And if you maintain that, you can get quite unwell. So someone who is fasting and they're also diabetic, uh, what kind of foods should they especially in Ramadan, what kind of food should they be really eating to actually ensure that their, their, their sugar level is not impacted in a negative way? Or, you know, what would be foods that you would recommend? So avoid sweets if you can. Okay. Um, uh, so for example, the common item uh, is a date mm. that people would break their fast with. Is, is that sugar a problem for someone who's, who's diabetic? So, so if you have one or two days, that's fine. I think don't have too many days because it's, it is uh, one of those fruits which has a very high glycemic index, meaning a high sugar level. So a sweet uh, day to break your fast is absolutely fine, but not many, many through, mm. through the kind of uh, day. So th that's one thing. Uh, from a sugar point of view, uh, try to avoid um, sweet products like Indian sweets. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Um, yeah, try, as I said, um, try not to fry your food. Try to avoid these products altogether and eat things like fruits. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, fruits have sugar. They, they do have sugar, yeah. but generally if you um, focus on low glycemic fruits, uh, they would certainly help. They're healthy as well. Um, they have low sugar load, so to speak. Right. So um, that's quite important. Um, try to um, avoid eating samosas um, and things like that. Try to, if, if you really have to alternate, so to have it one day, have it, don't have it another day. Mm. Um, also, when you have your iftar, don't, it's very difficult to do, but don't overeat. It's very tempting to eat and eat, uh, unfortunately, but try not to. Um, try to drink lots of water. That's very important because fasting through the day... Um, you have been dehydrated. Your, absolutely. Yeah. Dehydration can affect your kidneys. If you have kidney disease, it can affect um, your diabetes. It can give you things like constipation, can give you headaches, other things. So hydration is very important. When you hydrate yourself, try to drink water not uh, sugar stuff. Also avoid caffeinated uh, drinks like tea, coffee. I know we like to have one at the end of the day. I don't have too many or try to avoid it altogether. That can make you more dehydrated. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so lots of water, eat moderate amounts, um, eat, uh, avoid sugary foods, avoid fr fried foods. That's uh, from the iftar point of view. I think from the sahri point of view, um, you want to eat something where it's going to give you energy through the day, slow release in your tummy. Porridge. Exactly. So uh, we are well versed with that porridge. Um, I know we talk about rice and how it can affect your uh, diabetes, but basma if you're going to eat a rice, basmati rice is good because, again, that releases the sugar slowly. Right, so okay. through the day, if you have it in sahri, should through the day, which keep you... For, uh, what about uh, brown rice? So, yeah, the, people do talk about brown rice, it's good, um, but not as good as basmati rice, okay. actually. So that's one thing to uh, bear in mind. But the thing is, if, if someone's had rice, maybe during iftar, in the sense of biryani or something like that, I'm not sure if they need to have rice again <laughs> later on in the morning, as in for suhoor. They could be having some... I would say for suhoor, it would be in our interest to have something much more healthier, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially when, from an energy point of view. I think that's where we need to be much clever and much smart. So, you know, those things that release, you know, like lots of energy that can k keep you going, yeah. uh, you know, especially if you're going to fast where you're in parts of the world where the, uh, the d day length is, you know, quite long. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, living in the Northern Hemisphere this time, yes, we're moving away from summer. We're still going to be fasting 16 to 17 hours through the day. So we need to maintain the energy. Yes, I'm, I'm not advocating you eat rice or things like that in both uh, the meals. Um, you should avoid it, certainly, in the iftar. But in the sahri, if you really have to have your rice, have basmati rice. Lentils, uh, that's a good source. Porridge, that's absolutely important. That will have a slow release of energy. So these things will keep you going through the um, day. Um, try to drink and hydrate before you start your fast so in uh, Sahri drink lots of uh, clear water uh, that will certainly help so um, these are the things to do avoid sugary foods avoid salty food as well so that makes you more dehydrated it makes you want to drink so if through the day um, if you have salty food in Sahri you're gonna struggle so try to avoid that as well thank you very much uh, Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali uh, on behalf of the community hour uh, with Ramadan online with the East London Mosque 
It's about staying connected, bringing the masjid uh, to your house, alhamdulillah. Once again, uh, it was wonderful having uh, this discussion. I hope everyone who is watching has benefited. Don't forget to like, uh, comment, share, follow, and of course, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, press the bell icon for any new notifications. Uh, inshallah, we will join you once again very soon uh, with another subject. Uh, in the meantime, stay well, stay healthy. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Kareem, Dr. Abdul Wadud Kamali, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramadan Kareem. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ramadan Online. Stay connected to the East London Mosque. Assalamu alaikum. My brothers and sisters, the masjid is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that every masjid has costs. They have to pay bills. They have to meet the expenses. These expenses are actually paid by many volunteers and donors who give their money in the good cause. Are you from among those who spend on the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the needs and the requirements for those who would attend the masjid and for those who would actually come and pray? If you do, then alhamdulillah, your money is being spent in the right direction you would actually earn a great reward for everyone who comes into the masjid and benefits from it for every act of worship that is engaged in within that masjid. So remember, it's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only should you make sure that you come and attend, but you should make sure that you donate and consider it an honor to give in such a good cause. It's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan comes to us at times and makes us uh, present excuses, I'm not happy with this, I'm not happy with that. Those are all excuses. Many of us wouldn't mind spending so much just for food or just for leisure or just for something that wouldn't really bring back much benefit or profit. But when it comes to spending in the cause of Allah, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think we can all do better. Barakallah feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.